Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this talk um, about basically sort of nature and swimming and water and and deafness, a sort of lovely, lovely mixture of all of that. And I'm very apologetic. I do, do have a green dress. I nearly wore it. Um, <laughs> but it's sort of sleeveless, and I thought that the day, the day didn't actually warrant it. So apologies that I'm in flor flowers rather than green, like these two gorgeous um, people I'm going to interview. So we have here Lynn Buckle, uh, who... Um, one, she won the Barbellion Prize Award for What Willow Says, her second novel, which is an absolutely glorious read. It's sort of a love story between a grandmother and the, the child that she is bringing up solo. Um, and it's really exploring deafness, what it means, what signing means, and, it, and an awful lot more. Um, there's a lot of nature, trees. Uh, it's, it's a glorious, glorious read. She is a deaf, hard of hearing artist. She's an activist and a tutor. Um, she hosts Ireland's Climate Writers Group at the Irish Writers' Centre, which I think is fantastic. Hence the green. Hence the green. <laughs> and Nina, Minya, sorry, I'm, Minya, I'm, going, I'm, yeah. going to I'm going to mispronounce you, I know I am. <laughs> Minya Powlers, is it? Powles, yeah. Powles, great. okay. She's a lyricist, a poetic essay, with a po poetic essay collection that blends memoir and nature writing. And she first learned to swim in Borneo, where her mother was born, and her grandfather studied freshwater fish. And she weaves together memories, dreams, exploring migration, food, family, earthquakes, and the ancient, which I found so fascinating, the, I'm going to mispronounce this probably too, Luninsula calendar? Uh, Lunisola. Lu Lu Lunisola. Yeah. The Lunisola calendar as she reflects on a girl who has spent between two cultures. She's brilliant on unconscious racism, on identity and where you belong and where home is. Um, and she's also quite superb at des describing swimming and what it brings for people. Um, I don't know whether any of you were at the festival swim earlier, but um, we had a gorgeous time in the really warm sea. Mm. Well, I thought it was really warm. <laughs> And I only saw two jellyfish. <laughs> um, so, so this is going to be a, a lovely discussion, I think. And Lynn is going to start, and she's going to talk about her book, and then she's going to read, and then Nina will do the same. And I'm going to then throw questions at the two of them. And after that, it's over to you. So, shall we start? And Lynn is signing, if anybody was wondering. So yeah, I'll just introduce the book anyway. Yeah. You said that brilliantly, and um, there are so many, so many parallels I think between my book and your book. Nina. There really are. You know, with, with, to do with language, to do with place and belonging, and what Willow says, like you said, is the story of a grandmother who suddenly finds herself in the position of rearing her deaf granddaughter. So she isn't familiar with sign language, and they develop their own kind of home sign which is a, a kind of a, a, the standard name for the kind of nicknames and not just nicknames, but it's the unofficial sign language that families develop and only use at home. And from that, you can develop, you know, ISL or ASL or BSL or any formal languages. But it's also about um, how one navigates in a world which isn't quite prepared to facilitate your deafness. And rather than taking any stance on that, the grandmother is very open to those kind of, um, to the politics, I suppose, of deafness and being de deaf. And whether, you know, the um, hearing aids or the implants are simply there to benefit hearing people, or will they benefit the, the child more? But more importantly, it's about realising, you know, language deprivation at the end of the day it has to be dealt with. But they, they use nature anyway as a heuristic device, I suppose, for bringing their relationship together and for learning, le learning a language. And they're very much a part of um, the Bog of Allen, where I live in County Gildare. 
So it's all about them discovering through trees their love for one another and their love for languages. And how do you communicate meaning when you're not fully um, conversant in one language or the other? So it's about developing that relationship as well. And of course, language comes into your book too. That's yeah, your... absolutely. Um... Oh, sorry, I forgot to do the reading. Oh yes, I, I better so do, you, you, do your reading. I'll do my introductory reading, and, and this, this is this is from the beginning. But this, and is, this is good because there is so much to go is. from one to the other. Apologies for that. And this really explains what they do throughout the book. You know, they're 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 using um, their relationship, and they're they're trying to listen to the trees. Now, how do you listen to the trees if if you're deaf? Um, so the child is obviously looking, looking at the waving of, of the branches and trying to kind of connect that with her own sign language. And the grandmother is learning to be more attentive, I suppose, to the sounds that she can hear, and she's sharing those with the granddaughter. So I thought I'd pick a summary, a summary chapter, because it's, um, well, it's all written throughout the space of a year. So this is a fairly summary spot here. And, and it's not weeping willows. The story is what Willow says, but it's, it's normal Sally tree throughout. But this, in this particular section, it's a, a weeping willow. There stands a weeping willow, all sweeping fronds and curtain shadow. Salix Babylonica stamped onto a black label on its trunk. We sit underneath among cigarette papers and cider bottles and metal rings dug into the ground. She asks me what the tree thinks of the state it's living in. It doesn't. But how do you know, she signs. But I want to sleep in the heat, not explain anthropomorphic tendencies or give botanical references from Latin dictionaries. Listen, tell me what it says. I shut my eyes and concentrate on noises. The tree may as well not be there. I hear traffic, I tell her before breaking it down into cars, lorries, going over speed bumps, even a bus. I'm getting good at this. Birds, too, lots of them, talking to each other, fighting and chirping and singing. And the river, I can hear that, too. I open my eyes to see hers wide and realize just how much she's missing. The tree, again. I expect a swishing sound. Nothing. I pretend, say I can hear and try the music of sleep and meditation. She knows I'm kidding, as we lie back and look up through the domed canopy against the sun. What do you think it sounds like, I ask her. Insects. And it says, I hide your rubbish. Ah, come on. Let's do every tree in the park. One of them must be talking. I want to find the stridulations which she imagines, the scytherisms of rustling trees, their sighs and modulations, if they have them. But I hear nothing. We go from pine to fir to rowan and silver birch, elder, alder and larch, from horse chestnuts bearing early fruits to Irish oaks with neat round trunks. Each of them already features in the anthology, anthology of trees I'm making. They were smaller back when I started it, when I knew even less about identification keys and hybridization, and there were many duplicates drawn in my confusion. She is throwing silent shapes, drawing names for them in the air, her hand movements so much more descriptive than the words we share, inventions born, born of observations. She already knows the slow, steadfast way an oak tree grows, or how eucalyptus rushes to the sky in the fight for light how aspen quivers and ivy gropes. Our vocabulary expands at her invention, our very own sign language. I should not build confusion, should ad adhere to official Irish sign language, should be one step ahead, should facilitate standardization. I don't. She's too beautiful to correct, so we adopt her signs and save learning conventions for later. And not one tree murmurs during our study. And what are leaves for, if not stealing sunlight or harmonies from breezes? The acoustics of village life predominate. She assures me, we will read the trees with practice. That's really lovely. <laughs> it's just such gorgeous poetic language. And I think the relationship 
building up between the, the grandmother and the, and the granddaughter is so powerful as well. Thank you. And I, I was quite surprised because one, one critic criticised the fact that I would use poetic language when talking about um, a deaf child. And presumably she didn't realise I was deaf because she said, how can deaf people understand rhythm? Well, we do. It's, it's in sign language. We do understand rhythm <laughs> and irony. <laughs> yes, I've just um, ghosted a book about a band um, who have been gigging for 50 years and they said they were that they were very surprised when there was a deaf group really enjoying their music and dancing. And it was, of course, the vibration and the rhythm that they sure, just, yes. they, they absolutely loved. Yeah, you yeah. can feel the deep sounds. Yeah. You feel them. It's really, really interesting. And, of course, you are a poet, Nina. And your book is, is equally gorgeously poetic. So would you like to explain and read a passage? I, w I would. Thank you. And thank you, both of you. And, Lynn, that was gorgeous to listen to. And I wanted to keep listening um, but, yes, so uh, thank you all of you for being here as well. It's my first time in Ireland, which is very lovely. Um, so Small Bodies of Water is my first um, <laughs> real book, I guess. Um, it's a collection of essays, and it started out with me wanting to write more about swimming, um, which is something I've just loved since I was very small and is one of the few times, I think when I'm underwater, I just feel very um, at home in my body and very myself. And so that was a connecting uh, through a thread that connected a lot of my writing. Um, but it expanded and became a book that's also about language and moving around many different places and um, just growing up uh, mixed race. Because um, my dad is, he's a white New Zealander and my mum is Malaysian Chinese New Zealander. So yeah, so I'll read a short bit from the first essay, uh, which is called A Girl Swimming is a Body of Water. Where is the place your body is anchored? Which body of water is yours? Is it that I've anchored myself in too many places at once, or nowhere at all? The answer lies somewhere in between. Over time, springing up from the in-between space, new islands form. My first body of water was the swimming pool. Underwater, I was like one of Gong Gong's little silver fish with silver eyes like one of those he catalogued and preserved in gold liquid in jars on the shelf in the room where I slept, trapped there, glimmering forever. It was here that I first taught myself how to do an underwater somersault, first swam in deep water, first learned how to point my, to point my toes, hold my legs together, and kick out in a way that made me feel powerful. Here we spent hours pretending to be mermaids. But I thought of myself less as a mermaid and more like some kind of ungraceful water creature, since I didn't have very long hair and wasn't such a good swimmer. Perhaps half orca, half girl. To swim in Wellington Harbour is to swim in the deep seam between two tilted pieces of land that have been pulled apart over time. Repeated movements along the Wellington Fault have caused cliff formations to rise up above the harbour's western shore. Little islets, Makado, Matu, and Mokapuna, which punctuate the narrow neck of the harbour, are actually the tips of a submerged ridge that runs parallel to the Tanifa-shaped Miramar Peninsula. Near Oriental Bay, the harbour carries debris from a summer storm just past. Shattered driftwood, seaweed blooms, plastic milk bottle caps, earlobe jellyfish. The further out I swim, there is a layer of clear molten blue. It's January, the height of summer, and I've flown home from Shanghai, where I've been living for a year studying Mandarin at university. My friend Kerry and I dive above and below the rolling waves. 
at this moment in our lives, neither of us is sure where home is exactly. But underwater, the question doesn't seem to matter. Emerging from nowhere, a black shape draws close to my body, and I lurch, reaching for Kerry. But then I see the outline of wings. The black shag is mid-dive, eyes open, wings outstretched and soaring down to the deep. Kawo Pu, the native black shag, they perch on rocky beaches all over Wellington Harbour, holding their wings open to dry in the wind and sun. Another wave rises over us and we turn our bodies towards it, opening. Home is not a place, but a collection of things that have fallen or been left behind. Dried agapanthus pods, the exoskeletons of cicadas, tiny ghosts still clinging to the trees, the discarded shells of quail eggs on pawpaw's plate, cherry pips in the grass, the drowned chrysanthemum bud in the bottom of the teapot. Some things are harder to hold in my arms. The smell of salt and sunscreen. Mint green blooms of lichen on rock. Wind-bent Pahutakawa trees above valleys of driftwood. Thank you. Thank you. It does strike me that if there's one good thing to have come from lockdown, it's that we all have a better appreciation for nature. If you can only go 2K, you actually look at what's around you. And I know certainly that I appreciated my surroundings so much more. And I think these books have become so much more relevant because of that. And also the swimming. I was interviewing Ruth Fitzmaurice, who's a writer who's, um, I don't know whether you're aware of, I found my tribe. Um, she basically, her husband was dying. He had, he had um, motor neuron disease. He was young and she had five children. And to wet her way to survive was to throw herself into the cold sea every day. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, I remember interviewing her and practically nobody swam in the winter. Mm. And of course now it's... Yeah, you can't go to a beach around Ireland without, you know, there are the eight o'clock swimmers and the nine o'clock swimmers, and it's become massive. It's lovely that people have discovered nature through force of lockdown. Yeah, mm. you know, the, the woods that I describe are all actual places which I would walk and, and would have discovered with my children and would have stood there every day doing the research for this book, trying to hear what it sounds like through my hearing aids. So I know them very well. And then suddenly, after I'd finished the, the book and it had been sent off to the publisher, we had lockdown. And those very same woods are just packed with people. They're teeming with people. Yeah. And it's wonderful to see everybody enjoying them for the first time. And the yeah. canals and the waterways and, like you said, the beaches. Yeah. And So all, all our private walking spots and all our private well, swimming spots are now, are now very public, aren't they? This is, this is the downside. I, I, I was, uh, there's a guy who was, in, he was sort of down by the... spent his days by the river looking at the kingfishers and things, and he said, now people are tramping across and he can't find his peace. Well, I worry so about there nature is that. as well, you know, because yeah. it's yet another way of us exploiting nature and using it to its disadvantage. And I do worry about that, you know, if, if a woodland such as the one that I describe in the book is walked through by hundreds and hundreds of people for eight hours a day, you know, what do the animals do? They're having to hide for that entire time and the creatures are having to kind of disappear and being chased by dogs and kids. So it's yet another way of us just exploiting nature. So I, I think we've gone too far the other way as well. Yeah, possibly. The other reason why I think these books are so perfect for today's world is that both of them are very easy to read. I love the style of both of them. They're, they're in short bits and, you know, it, 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 they flow. You can, you can really, it's a reading experience. It's gorgeous. It actually reminds me a bit of Colin McCann's, I, I can't remember, I can't pronounce. Perry, so many, yeah, Perry, yes, so many yes. words I can't pronounce. <laughs> it's dreadful. Um, you know, he, he did that same sort of thing, although his was a violent book, of course, because um, it was about... Um, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict, about particularly two men. But, but it, it's, I find it, it very easy. And is it, is it a security, do you think? I mean, did you write this book before lockdown? There's, there's bits of lockdown in it. Yeah, but I, I finished it in lockdown, definitely. But it, it's a very unusual 
Yours particularly, I think, is a very unusual right. way of writing. And it's mm. absolutely gorgeous. But did you have an example? I mean, mm. it, were you copying, not copying somebody sure. else, but I mean, it's such a lovely, unusual style. Where did that come from? Yeah, great question. I think um, I learn almost everything that I um, kind of absorb as a writer, I learn from poetry. Um, so as a poet, I'm very often reading poetry, and when I, whenever I'm stuck on any writing project, it's poetry that really gets me unstuck and maybe also because I'm a poet or maybe the other way around, but I have a very short attention span, so therefore I'm, I'm always wanting to write short things. So the book, um, to me, it's very, very long, but it's actually not, um, and it's just it's made up of many short essays, and I would work, work on them like that, like small pieces of a whole, and then at the end I had all these pieces, and then I kind of put them in a rough order and my editor helped me shape them into really, yeah, it's not chronological, so kind of weaving them together, which was really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And I think I learn a lot from essayists in this regard, yeah. like um, Annie Dillard um, and how she writes about the natural world um, and other experimental writers, I think. Um, yeah, so it was a fun, it was a bit of an experiment and mm -hmm. I knew it was a bit different from other memoirs, but that was definitely my intention. Was it also quite a, a, a short story have, has become incredibly popular yeah. recently, and I think some writers are doing this link short stories, and they will say, because I have a column for debut mm. writers, so I'm very well aware of, of what's coming out, and some of them actually say that it's the way, they're so scared of the novel, but if they do these link short stories, suddenly there is actually the novel. Is, was it a bit the same with you, do you think? I, th I think I can definitely relate to that, um, to to kind of not think of it as I'm writing a, a memoir or an autobiography, which to me just would be quite terrifying. So yeah, to, to, to put lots of smaller pieces together, I think really helped just to get me writing. Um, and also because, um, as you mentioned, Lynn, some of it was written more recently in lockdown, but then other pieces were much older. So it was kind of, yeah, kind of weaving them together. Um, and, but I thought, Lynn, as well, because you make use of the diary form mm. quite a bit, right? And mm. I loved that, too. And I've got some diary bits. Um, that really helped me as a way of um, kind of when I, when I go for swims, keeping a kind of swimming diary was really mm. useful. And I love that as a form in both fiction and non-fiction. Yeah, it's a handy structure to hang. Really the, great, the yeah. Around, it? I mean, my problem is stopping, you know. I just keep mm. writing and writing and writing yeah. and writing and writing and it's having to cut back. And um, But this is only a short novel. In the nicest novelette. possible way, I do love short books. I love them Because too. you can really appreciate them. I, I, my heart tends to sort of stop if somebody yeah. says, this is a de wonderful debut writer, it's 800 pages yeah. long, and I think, I've got a week. <laughs> Please. Yes, in an evening you can read this. <laughs> um, but tell me then, what was the process for you? It was, it was literally, I had the beginning and I had the end, as the same I do with all my novels, and it was just kind of right through. Um, now, obviously, I can plot everything before I go, so I have, like, January, February. Well, it doesn't start in January, it starts in, in, in the summer and ends in late spring. But I, you know, having post-it notes in a, in a line all around my room and kind of, if January here, February here, and then I'd move them all around and say, no, that doesn't work for January. But I had to fit that story within to the calendrical mm. year. You know, I wanted to have that kind of um, and, and the marriage. idea of the, the deaf granddaughter and of the nature coming into it. Did that come to you together, or did the story come and the nature was a good way to tell it? It, it, it all happened at once, to be honest. Yeah, mm. it did. Um, I just wanted to... Does it to... spool into your head in a gorgeously... It just spools out. Magic Sometimes way. I don't know where it comes from. I think, how, how did that just end up on the page when I'm typing it, you know? And I, 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 think, I, I don't know where it comes from. You know, I, I did have this idea that I wanted these the very, like I did with the last novel, I wanted it to be very intense, so you didn't, I didn't want lots of um, characters, I just wanted to cut it down to the main two characters, so it was the, the intensity of that relationship in this one place, so they had that security of belonging, like you were saying, you know, the, 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 the difficulty of not feeling that you're belonging when you're moving from place to place, 
And, the, and there is that lack of belonging in that they don't know whether they belong to the hearing world or to the deaf world, but they very much belong in this place. So, you know, the, the landscape and the nature that's within their landscape was very much a character, you know, right from the get-go. So you have the two people and, and you have the Bog of Allen and all the mythologies and the stories that go come with that, some which I made up and some which come from, you know, the, the kind of the, the Irish legends anyway. And, and I live in a place where, you know, Finn McCall supposedly lived on the Hill of Allen and then you have um, in Leash and Offaly and... Uh, Lucre and Bommel and you know and, and the River Boyne its source is, is very near me in Carberry so all those stories kind of flow into the Bog of Allen anyway they're, they're just there you know the kids going to school and learn all of these stories so it was inevitable that they would land up in my book in some form or another so it's and they they just kind of you know like like Heaney there are all these layers in the bog you know and and this we don't have in ISL we don't have a sign for bog but BSL has a sign and it's this and it kind of shows the weight of all those layers you know uh, it's just kind of now that's quite close to chocolate, actually. Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Same colour. <laughs> another thing the books have in common, I was very impressed. You, you say a sentence somewhere, there is no one as deaf as sometimes as a hearing person. Mm. <laughs> and, and the way that the hearing world um, treat the child, and also the way that she has these extra sensual things, like the way she treated the dog. Oh, yes, when it was going to the vet. When it's going to yes. the vet, and she calms it down, and she has this wonderful calming... And also the, the noises she makes to the dog, which is so soothing. And it sort of just reminded me of she's trying to get accepted in the hearing world. And then that lovely time when she meets a girl with sparked the ear. Yeah, ear, she, sees, hearing she, she meets her tribe, you know. And I, and I wanted the book to be positive. I didn't fill it with all the... I could write 25 books on ableism and how difficult it is to be deaf. But I didn't want to write that. I wanted to, to keep it positive and... My agenda was, and there's no point in me being sneaky about it, my agenda was that people would love the beauty of her signing, go off and learn sign language, so my life would be easier. <laughs> right. And, and in your book, of course, it, being mixed race, you talk a lot about that and about how people say terrible things sometimes and this unconscious racism, which you feel quite strongly. Yeah, of, um, of course. I guess uh, it was in writing this book that for the first time... Um, I found a way of writing about these many, many moments of um, casual racism that I, I think in, in recent years, I think probably they've, they've happened um, all along my kind of my growing up, but more recently I've become more aware of them and aware of myself and how I'm seen um, by the world around me. So, yeah, and I think also... So I live in the UK, in London. I've lived there for four years. And that experience also is very different from, um, I think, growing up in Asia and in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So I wanted to write about that too, and these histories of colonisation and empire that are so visible. I'm just walking around London as a city, which is quite surreal. Um, so... Yeah, there's many, um, I could have maybe written many essays about that, but I really only touch the surface, I think, and I'm still always um, unravelling these issues. You were very, I was very interested when you were saying that it's when you're accepted as a white person by the people, white mm. people around you, but then you are subject to their exactly. racism. Exactly, yeah, I think... Um, there's an American writer, Alexander Chi, whose work has been really formative for me. He writes essays and, he, and novels. And um, he, in a podcast, he said something that really articulated something that I think I've felt for so long but never put into words. And the whole book is, is kind of about this. And I only listened to the podcast a few months ago. I was like, wow. <laughs> but he said, um, in any social interaction, meeting someone new... He doesn't know how that person's going to perceive him. So he's mixed as well. He's Korean-American. And sometimes he says he passes as white, sometimes he doesn't. And that experience is really similar for me. So I meet someone new and I just genuinely don't always know if they're, if they're, how they see me, what they see when they look at me. So I wanted to write about this slippery experience um, 
and how it feels when you do find um, people with, with whom you feel a kinship. And in, I feel lucky in recent years I've met other um, mixed writers and writers of color, particularly Asian writers, which has been so um, freeing and nourishing to talk about these things with them. And yeah. Mm. I loved the childhood bits of yours and the childhood fear, and in your case, it, it was fear of earthquakes because that, you, that was a very real thing in, in, in New Zealand. Um, yeah. yeah. And I've got a daughter living on a fault line. <laughs> in Canada, but she's, she's a seismologist, so she's delighted to be living on a fault line. Um, but it's a, it, I, I, I just sort of have a, the childhood fear thing. I think we all maybe have it... I've just been thinking about that all day, actually, because when mm. I was a child, well, there was a nuclear thing in the background, but I can remember being terrified. Of, every time my parents went out, I thought they'd be killed in a car crash. And I can remember real terror that I get myself in a about aged eight or nine, I'd get myself in a complete state from about an hour before they were expected home. And I just wonder whether all children, perhaps, go through some sort of terror, whatever. Do you think? I, I was wondering, why, why were we convinced that the thing that we should be most wary of, most scared of, was quicksand? I mean, how many times have you encountered quicksand? <laughs> you just don't, yeah. do you? <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same. <laughs> Quicksand was up there, definitely. Exactly. Yes. Um, yeah, and that was a. I feel like that was from pop culture movies. I had quicksand nightmares, but then yeah, but then as you say, I had tsunami nightmares. Still have tsunami nightmares, uh, earthquake dreams. Um, but instead, that was like a very real, uh, real and constant threat living in Wellington, which is on multiple fault lines. Um, but yeah, I think it, the. It wasn't so much terror, but like a current, almost like a, a buzzing, background buzzing of like ele an electrical yeah. current of anxiety that then becomes very normal and so normal you don't notice it. So I was interested in that question of anxiety, which, um, so I, I do have anxiety as well. So yeah, just I was, I think earthquakes were a really nice way of, um, way in to writing about yeah. um, that area of mental health that I've not really written about much in poetry or anything else, so, mm -hmm. yeah. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, that make, makes me think as well, you kind of bring me back to, um, you know, places of swimming and places that you're scared of. And I was scared to, to go swimming, not just because my lungs are banjaxed, but um, also because I'd have to take my hearing aids out and I'd be kind of going commando and, and wouldn't hear anything at all. And I was wondering, you know, not all nature spaces are open to everybody. I was in a very uh, interesting uh, literary festival, the Kendall Mountain um, Festival last October, I think it was. And all of the authors would have had chronic Ill illnesses or disabilities. And some of them would be bedbound, so they wrote about nature from their beds. So it'd either be from memory or from the sounds that would hear out of the window. A bit, a bit like, what's that book? You know, Sound of a Snail Walking Across a Page. That's the name of one book, so I remember. You know, you can, you can find so much nature in the tiniest little space, but some spaces are... are out of bounds for some of us, I think. Um, not necessarily all the time. I have been in the sea whilst I've been down in West Cork, but, uh, you know, it's that kind of a... I didn't feel safe going into the sea today. That's terribly sad, actually. Yeah, and some of that's internalised ableism, and some of it was like, what if somebody wants to come up and talk about my book, and I'm going, well... Because I, you know, <laughs> I want to hear what they're saying. Do you understand sign? That if, if you do understand sign, I've already said sign that already. If you do understand sign, please come up and sign with me afterwards. Don't be afraid if you're only just learning. Just practice on me. You know, I love it. I love it. And, and have uh, you really have good. you been practicing sign a long time? Yeah. Well, I see because I was born in England. Initially, I first learned BSL, and then we moved to Ireland and. If you're not aware of that, ISL is different to BSL. You know, it's not the same language. Okay. It's completely different. It's more similar to ASL. And, I, and anyone who watches me signing knows I'm really bad at it anyway. But yes, <laughs> I am still learning, trying to get better. My vocabulary is very small. Um, but yeah. I, I, both books, of course, do touch on grief as well. And your grandmother has lost lots of children. Mm. Um, but particularly the, the, the mother of this granddaughter... And I love those descriptions of the way um, 
that she's, with her language, she's almost dancing. And, it, it's, it, and it's sort of bringing back the memories of the of her mother, sorry. That, oh, yes. Uh, I, I and, and the way that she was yes. used to dance on the stage and, and, be, and also put herself out in the front when yes, she was meant to be the, in the, the chorus. the confidence of small children, gorgeous, you know. <laughs> gorgeous passages. I love those. Yeah, I, I, that was actually um, taken from real life. That was based on one of my real children. <laughs> she used to... Um, she was terrible at dancing, absolutely terrible at dancing. Didn't have a clue, and the dance teacher would put her at the back during shows, and she had so much confidence. She would just straight in the front, you know, where she wasn't meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> the joy of life, but yes. Um, so yes, she's she's and, and she's reminiscing anyway. And, and this granddaughter obviously reminds her of the daughter that she has lost, and, and that ties in with the the mythologies of the area anyway, and and the the, the myth that that this children are lost in the river who are drowned in the river and they kind of reappear in some other form or yeah. another and yeah. that's what's happening for her in, in her life now with the granddaughter she's got a second chance and if, with yours it's it's mourning your grandparents hmm. yeah well my so my grandfather is still alive actually but I of course I haven't seen him in a very long time hopefully we'll see him this December um, but yeah, my, my grandmother, my papa, did pass away before the pandemic. Um, so I, I w did want to write a lot about their their home and a bit about their lives in Malaysia. Um, but thinking about grief, I think I ended up writing more about um, ecological grief than I intended, and and or or a feeling like imminent. Um, there would be imminent loss um, in the environment around me, and and that was challenging. I think I didn't intend to write that grief into the book, but it was also unavoidable. Um, yeah. And as a poet who kind of lives in a big city, relatively untouched by um, kind of devastating effects of climate destruction, I didn't necessarily feel I had a lot useful to say, but then the act of um, making a record, keeping a diary, noticing things, noticing changes, which um, your book made me think of, Lynn, with your um, references to weather and seasons and shifts in weather and climate, that in itself um, did feel like it had some value. So that's, yeah, that's my, that was my approach to writing grief. And there's a lot of sensual stuff in the, with the cooking gardening and flowers and that bit I couldn't pronounce the calendar sure yeah <laughs> definitely yes the, the lunisolar calendar which yeah. is a, a Chinese agricultural calendar uh, which became a really poetic um, a kind of structure to think about um, yeah I think I'm always most interested in the senses and the body um, how language dwells in the body um, and how we experience memory. Um, for me, that's very often through food, so I am always thinking about food. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I can't really separate like how I'm feeling. I can't separate that from like what I'm eating. <laughs> so um, eating's very important to me, so I'm always writing about and, food. And is well. the eating, does it relate the eating to people and experiences Definitely. and cultures? Is that, is that all part of what it is? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Food's especially been a kind of portal for me, for my Chinese heritage. When I was, especially when I was little, when I didn't really, wasn't really part of a Chinese community in Aotearoa. So food was the thing, and it still is definitely so. Yeah. And you've made that gorgeous dress you're wearing. Oh yes, I have. That, this is a lockdown lockdown hobby. Is was sewing, and um, yeah. So <laughs> became obsessed it, and it was really useful to have another creative I don't know if you find this either of you but something creative to do with my hands that was not writing um, or reading because those things became very challenging um, so yeah it was another kind of fun satisfying thing I, I need to bake that's my thing yes yeah yeah and try not to eat what I've baked that's the difficult bit <laughs> I, I wrote a lovely book butter honey pig bread um, I can't remember the name of the author can you remember the name of the author no, orange cover butter honey pig bread and she's an African writer and oh you really want to eat everything in sight that she describes you know you can imagine it all and it's the vehicle for her storytelling and, and just like when I was reading your 
cookbook book and I, I was drooling, thinking of all these lovely recipes and things. And, and, I, I, lo and I love that because it really connects you to a story, to, like you say, to your emotions, doesn't it? Yeah. But what was sort of lo lockdown? I mean, looking back, lockdown was so terrifying and so dreadful. I think we forget. I think we forget what it was like at the beginning and how scared we all were. Um, but did you, have you learnt something, do you think? Have you changed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I've just, the main thing probably is that I've learnt to be kinder to myself um, and sl try in to slow. In what way? Oh, uh, sure. Oh, maybe in, in every way. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess giving myself more space and time um, because I, I think... Yeah, at times during lockdown, my anxiety would have reached a real peak. And so just um, taking more care and, and being kinder to myself. And, and I think slowing down, particularly when it comes to writing and making. I think before I was quite, um, I was quite prolific and, and enjoyed writing a lot. But now I think I really value not writing, um, which is a really important part of the creative process because okay. we can't be writing all the time. Sure. I think we're walking, swimming, gardening, cooking, mm. speaking to each other, resting. I think rest is, is really core to a lot of what we do as creative people. So it made me realize that and really think about it more. And were you able to get to any water? Um, not all the time, but I do live near the uh, the women's pond on Hampstead Heath Which in I'm London. Which I'm so jealous of. Yeah, and it was closed, of course, for a long period, but when yeah. it reopened, I was I felt just so grateful. It was within a kind of longish walking distance, which yeah. is amazing. Yes, I was, I was in the Isle of Wight with my mum, mm. actually, during um, the first lockdown, on the beach, literally. Mm. Um, but then, then when we came home, and, uh, the nearest water is 8K away. Mm. So I was deprived of water for mm. quite a while. And it, it matters. It matters, actually. It does, yes. No, when I moved to County Kildare here from, from West Cork, you know, I really missed the sea so much. But we have, um, we have, a, we have a bog beach, <laughs> which is beautiful in the Midlands. And it has sand in the, in the middle oh, of okay. the Midlands. So, yeah, that features in the story. And, and as what well. about you? Did you how, how did lockdown change you? Did it? Well, I didn't get scared like everyone else because, you know, on, by the 17th of March 2020, I had COVID myself, so oh, I was extremely ill. Some of my friends are here, so they know, they know what that was like. That's, it's the worst. I mean, that was the most scary, terrifying time. Did you end up in hospital? I did, yes, and the whole family caught it as well. And, you know, oh. so we didn't have that fear because everyone was, like absolutely too scared to go out and but as soon as the ambulance with the, uh, the white suits turned up to take me away you know everybody suddenly locked themselves in the houses and didn't go out again and lived in fear but we didn't live in fear because we'd had it now i know that's changed now and and you can get it four five six ten times and i've had it four times and you know it, you can still get it and be bad but you know we didn't have the um the injections then but what that gave for me was the same as you it made me slow down and it made me more creative and i just got tons of ideas for things to write and that was probably a bad thing because I, was, I started three novels and it's kind of which one do I finish and my publisher's going go which one are you going to give me <laughs> but it, it gave me lots of um, like you said that it gave me that realization that you don't have to be on the go all the time I think it's this kind of um, you know this very kind of Quaker work ethic you have to keep going you have to keep producing yeah, you yeah. have to be on, on the game the whole time and it made it uh, most writers I think realize and you can yeah. actually slow down, and that's absolutely fine and, too. And also, I think what is interesting is is this working from home. I mean, my daughter worked for the central bank, and she was begging to be allowed to do a day at home because she's got a couple of kids, and absolutely not. And of course, now they don't want them in. Well, that was a nightmare having the kids at home and, and doing everything. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> you know that that was that was really hard. You know, having having all the schoolwork and and not enough Wi-Fi, and no, I'm trying to work and and all of those. But um, you know, we we didn't kill anybody, so that was I, built, I built a writing shed. <laughs> Just... 
<laughs> it's like, I have a writing room, but that just doesn't work. You know, they can open the door. And no, I, I, I'd be on Zoom, and there'd be somebody, like, throwing sweets at my ankles. I'm kind of, I'm, get out, get out. 20 <laughs> steps away. I have 20 <laughs> steps between me and the house. Do you have grandchildren? Because you, the way you write about that grandmother, grandchild. Oh, I do, yes. No, I have a rake of them. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but the very first chapter, which is very, very short in the book, is a bit of a disclaimer by me saying, this, this much is mad in my house. We're all daft. We, we all have arguments over where are the hearing aids, where's this, what's that. We're quite happy about misunderstandings. We're very relaxed about that. This much is true. And then, go in, then I go into the novel. So, yes, I, I do have um, grandchildren, yeah. And, I, and none of my children have died, so... <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it's a very that. sad story in places, but you know, there's there's none other. But it's beautiful sad. It's the kind of sad that makes you kind I, of want I to cry. I think both happy. books are actually. I mean, they do have their sadness and they have their um, inquiry. And but I mean, basically, they are beautiful, um, lyrical, happy, joyful books. And I, I think. Yeah, they're both celebrations, aren't they, of of, of nature, and um, that's nature in sign language, and. Um, Sometimes you don't have the language to just appreciate nature. And I know, yeah. I know Kerry Nadotti, who's speaking tomorrow, is going to be talk, often talks about, you know, not having enough language and not having our language, you know, the Irish language. And Irish Sign Language is our third legally recognised language. Mm. And, and just that phrase, nature, for me, says so much because when I see somebody's fingers go up to here, this area here is where we start signing, you know, the different colours, you know, kind of the reds and the blues and the greens um, and the browns. So if I see somebody's hands coming up to here, I automatically see colour. And then I automatically see um, nice, because this is nice. But I see it happening twice. And that, you know, afford, that's a rare afford, uh, to afford a sign with both hands. You know, it's like, oh, really, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then it ends down here, and this is the area where we sign our feelings from. You know. And all of the feelings are signed here. And not just that, but the grammar means that it's really close to me. It's not just close to me, it, it is me. You know, it's not like the future out here or the past back here. It's written into the grammar how close nature is. It's not something separate, it's not something othered. That, you know, it's not that kind of, in the Western tradition of kind of white ecology that, that nature is something over there and the humans over here or up here and down here it's 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 together yeah. so just in that one one word um it says a huge amount to me and there's tons more things which i could yeah. say anybody who signs is going to say oh there's this this and this and this but it's it's written in, it's written into the syntax and the grammar that the, yeah. that nature holds all of that for us and supports us and we support it i think you know the eco poet karani baraka you know, she 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 will quite often say, it, but humans too. You know, everybody will kind of complain and, and stand up and fight for the rights of the orangutans. But you know, what about us humans? We are nature yeah. too, and I think that's a very important thing to remember mm. that it's not just about saving the world; it's about saving us too. Mm. I must say, the one thing that I do love about again about about climate change is that nobody can criticise my garden anymore. I just say, when I'm saving, I'm rewilding. Rewilding, indeed, yes. If, if there's one thing it's a that really you can nice excuse. take away from this evening is don't cut your lawn until September, and you'll, you'll, have, you'll, have done, you'll have done your bit. And I slip things in like that. I slip um, solutions into my story. Uh, obviously not to preach, to say, this is what you must do to save the planet, but there's a... There's a whole chapter based on a local woman here. If you're local, you'll know Sean Ed Jones, who was in Bantry Court. Who was, she was charged with rewilding, basically. And um, I wrote this before she was actually in court, so I made up my own my own um, sentence for her. But it's basically it's very similar. So I based it on the goddess Boyne, and um, yeah. So there was a positive outcome for her in the in the story. Yeah. Nina, how, how do you feel now about climate change? I mean, how big a worry, hope, is there any... Well, how, does, how does it on a day-to-day, -day, how do you think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's ever-present. And certainly it is a worry, <laughs> just to a, a bit of an understatement there. But 
I guess um, it does give me a degree of hope to write about the natural world. Um, and I think to, I think in poetry actually is where I learn a lot about how we relate to the natural world and just listening to you speak about um, sign language just then, Lynn, was really powerful and moments like that, I think, remind me of um, learning from poets, particularly um, indigenous poets in New Zealand, Maori poets, and also elsewhere in the world, just blurring this boundary that we, I think, in modern history have created, this kind of barrier between the human and the non-human, um, with human and, and nature, which um, I think is, is so arbitrary and we're often trying to write past or write through it. Um, so I think I'm always um, learning about this and I don't know, living in a big city is strange. You feel the effects of things such as a heat wave like we are at the moment in, in London and other cities but then not other things can feel quite abstract, kind of sea level rise and so on. Um, but that's something I'm always conscious of, I think, coming from the Pacific, growing up in Asia and the Pacific, um, where these issues are really urgent. So yeah. I think this global perspective is really, um, has been really valuable for me and is, I think I've learned a lot from that. And I think as writers, you know, we, we have a platform now and I think it's, we're duty-bound to use that yeah. to, to the benefit. And I think, you know, the step of making, making people fall in love with nature is the first step, but we have to go beyond that as well. We have to provide solutions because otherwise we do just become overcome with despair and lack of hope. You know, you always have to put in the hope. And it can, it can be in any, any genre of fiction, whether you're writing a crime novel or a romance novel or a YA novel. It, it doesn't really matter what genre you write in. You can put solutions to the climate crisis in, into your fiction, and that's what we're trying to do at the Climate Writers Group. That's my that's mission, and that's going to be written on my gravestone. Is it solution-based? Right. <laughs> and so, you know, it's sneak it in under the door. More people will read it, because there's no point speaking to the converted. Sure. People who already understand that we shouldn't be taking flights to Spain for our holidays. They, you know, I don't need to speak to those people. I need to speak to the people who are disinterested. So the more people who, who write it into the chiclet, who write it into their romance stories... I'm not allowed to say chiclet anymore. No, sorry. Correct me. <laughs> Women's commercial fiction. Women's commercial fiction is the most effective way, and men's and men's uh, crime novels. If, if that's if they won't read my novels, then the novels that that men will read, you know, the authors have a responsibility. I think, and it's so easy just to put in a in, in a few solutions, just like I did into this novel. You know, it's not a climate writing novel by in, by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some solutions in there, like rewilding. It could be a bit to do with recycling. It could be on the macro level, like the politics that needs to change, or it could be on the micro level. But okay. Just before I open it up to the audience, what next for both of you? Writing, I, I've got to decide wise. one of my three. <laughs> <laughs> Writing-wise, what next? I want to write, and I've already done this because it's, it's, I've written some articles already which are going to be published very shortly, I'm writing for deaf people rather than hearing people because this is definitely, and any, any of my deaf friends will tell you as well, this, this is written for the hearing world. It's an explanation, just like um, True Biz by Sarah Novick. You know, it's an explanation to the hearing world what it's like to be deaf. Whereas um, you see it in some of my short essays and poems and you see it in... Raymond Antrobus's a couple of his poems in All the Names Given. You'll see it in Meg Days, who's another deaf author. When we write just for a deaf audience, we're not accommodating a hearing audience. And I and other deaf people will understand the meanings. There are ten, tons more meanings. So, yeah, I'm just going to be a bit more selfish the next thing I write. Okay. And what about you, Nina? Um, that was inspiring to me as well. Um, well, I think after Small Bodies of Water came out, I felt which like... It, which was when? That was um, August last year, and okay. then the paperback came out this year, which was great. Um, and it made me, though, want to turn back to poetry a bit more, 
and um, try out writing um, different kinds of poems. So I think my next book, I'm sure, will be another uh, poetry collection. Not sure when, who knows. <laughs> um, and I'm also interested in writing a short novel, but I really have no idea how. So uh, maybe I'll learn. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> I, I do too, I really do. Um, any questions from the floor? Um, thank you, that was really inspiring to listen to. Um, I wanted to ask you both how you consider rhythm in your writing and the choices that you make. Rhythm. Did you hear that? Rhythm. I did, yes. And going back to the last thing I just said, I, I write how a hearing person would understand rhythm. And that's why I want to change for the next one. I'm going to write in the rhythm of sign, and that's, that would be very, very different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that sign language doesn't have a written form. Spoken languages have a written form. We don't have... We're, we're doing the translation as soon as we're having to put something onto a page or onto a laptop. Um, so, yet, I've only had a few poems published, but I do find writing poetry... I write a huge amount of bad poetry, but it really helps me tighten up my rhythm and it really does affect the way I write. And I think if I hadn't written any poetry to date, I'd be a very different writer. Mm. Um, so yes, I think writing poetry definitely, definitely helps with the rhythm it, of I, my poetry. I, I, it, reading both books, yes, poetry mm. has definitely helped the prose. No, absolutely, no doubt mm. about that. Yeah. yeah, I think I feel the same. Um, I'm not sure what my, yeah, I don't know what my writing would be like if I didn't read poetry. Um, I think I'm very often thinking about um, the texture and shape of a sentence, um, the shape of a paragraph, the way it looks on the page, even when I'm just writing an essay. Um, and these are things that will be on my mind when I'm writing a poem much more, but I think I bring these things over to when I'm writing prose, and so it gets a bit slippery, and sometimes I don't know if I'm writing a poem or not. So, and I think some of the essays in the book, they, they, are, they might feel a bit like prose poems, and I don't, a lot, some, many writers, particularly poets, do kind of read their work aloud, and that's also quite an interesting editing tool for me. Um, but I'm just thinking, I don't necessarily do that when I'm writing, but I will be thinking about how the words, how a sentence feels in the body, um, and that is completely to do with rhythm. Um, and in that case, maybe, I think maybe I would actually read it aloud. And, um, yeah, I, it's given me a lot to think about, so thank you for that question. So something that both of you have spoken about is climate grief and how important, and you've spoken about it at various points, not just in your books, but how important it is to not feel downhearted about it. But I want to know in a nutshell what keeps you both hopeful. Well, nat nature is what gives me joy and hope when as soon as I'm outside, either swimming like yourself or walking through the forests or walking up a mountain. It, it's just incredible. It, 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 the, the joy and the hope and the determination always comes back. Yeah, um, thank you, Kerry, for your question. And it's really hard, isn't it, um, sometimes? But I think thinking about um, writing, and w which is my world, I guess, is often thinking other writers and about publishing, which sometimes is, is also dispiriting, but I do feel that the f this field of nature writing really has become so much more expansive and can include um, definitely books like ours in a way that maybe, I'm not sure, if a couple of decades or less than that, a couple of decades earlier, there might not have been. Um, that that sincerely does give me hope, I think, just thinking of the breadth of perspectives then that can be reached in writing about the natural world, um, from 
you know, lenses of migration and indigeneity and disability and um, all of this, that really does give me hope, I think, um, even when it feels terrible, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? Um, I take it there are books outside, are there? There are. There are. Um, there are books outside that you can buy, and I recommend both books very, very highly. And you're willing to sign the two oh, of you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And, and, and sign in the and, sense And sign as well. and sign, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> as, as I said that, I was thinking a yeah, double entendu there. Yeah, um, thank you so much, the two of you. Thank it's you. been absolutely inspiring, both reading your books and talking to you. I've really, really enjoyed it. Mm. Thank you, thank and thank you. you all for coming.